You're more than welcome to eat. That's just fine. I brought a pen, but that's to take notes on. Phone. Oh. Did you find it hard to adjust time-wise? I find it hard to adjust time-wise. No, I was getting up at 4 a.m. out there anyway. Oh. So. I am like sleepy in the middle of the day, and like I make you all. No, I know. I think it's just so nice out that everybody's probably like, we're not coming in today. It's too nice. Yeah. I know. That'd be great. I'll hold it in the courtyard. would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, that has too many pages. No, that's frustrating. But I will say, I don't know what is going on with Dot Loop. They have messed this up our purchase agreements yeah. from December. So I don't know why that you can't do that and also i think somebody said the listing agreement you can't strike out the listing agreement anymore either right. which makes no sense because you should be allowed to strike it out and i have emailed them amanda's emailed them and we're waiting but i'm sorry i wish there was something i could say to do it makes zero sense so can't cannot help you as much as i should be able to all right let's see do we have people on zoom pull up zoom Hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Is there anybody on Zoom and can you hear us? There's five people on Zoom. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. All right. Perfect. Thank you. If there becomes a time you can't let me know, because if I move from in front of my computer for some reason, my it doesn't pick me up. So, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, how nice is it out there? It's 74. <laughs> I almost had a little sweat around. Yeah. Okay. And for those of you on Zoom that can't smell how good Lynette's food is that she has here, it smells really good. So, all right. Well, thanks for being here with us today. So I try and do this class about every three-ish months. And it's really just helpful for those people that have either got in the business recently or those that have been in the business for a long time that have forgotten a lot of things that they should know. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing that we'll go to is talking a little bit about LLCs and advert or LLCs and being in business for yourself. So I think do everybody sitting in this room, do you guys all have LLCs? I think we all do. So an LLC is a great opportunity for you to save money on tax. If you're not aware of that, instead of being paid under Rich Cosgrove, I'm paid under Cosgrove Sales LLC. Um, and so like this year for the state of Ohio, I didn't pay any income tax. And so those of you that uh, have filed for an LLC, kudos to you. And if you haven't, you should do that to save yourself. Um, and then you would just give your documents to Cassandra and we would pay you under the name of your LLC and issue your 1099 in that. Uh, some people choose to take taxes out of their LLC as far as weekly or monthly when you do a paycheck and others do not. Um, it depends on how your however your accountant wants to run it. So uh, we don't typically use corporations, but you can. Um, I suppose, but with corporation, you have to have shareholder meetings and board meetings, and I don't think anybody's doing that. So the LLC is a better way to do it, um, but you can track your miles just the same as you can if you're a person, an individual, um, but you write off everything under your LLC. So great, great opportunity there. Save some money. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about advertising. So these are in no particular order. There's about 24 slides, and usually it takes me about two hours to get through them all. I will try and attempt to get through them in an hour to save everybody time and get out 
on this beautiful day. So Ohio license law requires that the brokerage uh, name be either greater or more prominent than your name as the agent. And you're going to see that every agent almost everywhere does not do this correctly in the state of Ohio. I don't know what the laws are in other states. I, I can just tell you that's what it is in Ohio. Um, also, we the state of Ohio does not recognize team names. They do not recognize team names at all, with the exception of if your team name is larger or more prominent than the brokerage name, that's a problem. Otherwise, they don't recognize you as a team name. So on your agency disclosure forms, you would not put on there the Porterfield team or Diana Porterfield team or the Killy team or any other team. It would be the individual agent. So Diana Porterfield, Lynette Killy, Scott Killy, whatever that would be. Um, you do not use your team name on the agency disclosure form. But the full brokerage name uh, must be in all of your solicitations and advertising. So I can tell you that we had uh, an agent that has recently sent out flyers for from the brokerage that did not have a return address on them. Fine. That's you don't have to have a return address if you don't want to. You should. We'll get into that a little bit later, but you should put your return address on there. But they also didn't have anything about the brokerage name. It just said, if you're thinking about selling your home, give me a call today. Unfortunately, that's a that's a license law violation. You have to include the brokerage name in all of your solicitations. Uh, and because you're part of a franchise, Keller Williams has to be included as well. Our brokerage name is actually Legacy Group Realty. So it's actually the second in red here. It is not Keller Williams. It's not Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. It is Legacy Group Realty. You, because you are part of Keller Williams, do have to advertise using the third section, Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. But for the state, they just care about Legacy Group Realty. So what does that mean when you go to advertise? What are you advertising? Well, when I say advertising, I mean everything from a car wrap to a pen. Um, I will tell you that if you look at some of our agents close enough, you're going to find out that a lot of them have a shirt um, or information that they have on their person that does not include the broker's name. They don't have it at all, just their team name. That is a license law violation. It is fineable up to $500 per uh, instance that the division finds. So if you have five people in five shirts, they can find you $500 times five. So same thing with your. You can't just have your team name. No, because like I said, even though the division does not recognize team names, the only part of it that they care about for whatever reason that they do recognize is if your team name is advertised, but your brokerage name is not. That's a problem. And the same thing with the prominence rule would apply. I, I, in my opinion, I think Ohio has fallen way behind the times on team names. I mean, you know, I've been at Keller Williams since 2018. It was here before me and they had teams well before I got into real estate or, you know, when I got licensed. And so it's like, and that was 2002. In my opinion, the state is so far behind the times on a lot of things. And that's just one of them. Like, and in general, like in this day and age of branding and social media, like to put all of that on, like it makes you automatically look more clumpy oh, yeah. than somebody, another business who doesn't have to have all that sort of stuff. You can't just have a real simple random look. It's yeah. very clunky. And it is. <laughs> well, it is clunky. And the reason that it you feel is con it, it's confusing to consumers is because it is, but the division has taken the stance. They don't want the consumer to be confused. Their stance is, so, for example, you're not allowed to use, and I'm kind of ad-libbing here based on, on the conversation as far as slides go, but I'll just add this. You'll know that since 2000, I think it's July of 2021, you can no longer use the word associates or realty in a team name. You have to use group or team in your team name somewhere. Um, and that's because, you know, for things like Jose Medina and Associates, if you weren't putting your brokerage name in there, people think that JMA is actually a brokerage and it's not. They think that, you know, they could think the Killy team is a brokerage and it's not. And so that's the reason the division took the, the, the defense on it to say, we want to protect the consumer, but unfortunately it's not. It's just more confusing. Oh, you all look for Keller Williams. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. We're all our own individual business. We are. We are we have signed up with a brokerage and we're brokered with that, but we are our own business. So you yeah. could be calling the next person at Keller Williams and thinking it's all going to It's not helping one that kill you if you call another agent. Yeah, yeah it's brokerage. Yeah, unless they're on your team. Yeah, no, that's true. 
in a lot of states, the prominence rule doesn't apply. And Keller Williams actually is so relaxed with it. We don't have our signs with our phone numbers on them with Keller Williams. They don't care. They wouldn't care if Keller Williams was tiny in the bottom of the of of the sign and your name was huge and your team name was huge. They're not looking to promote Keller Williams, but the state of Ohio has different rules than other states do. And that's where the prominence comes in. So, so when I say advertising, it's every single thing you can think of. Every single thing you can think of when you advertise needs to have the brokerage name. Uh, all right. So Sandy says, I see so many times KW. Is that okay or should it be spelled out? So KW would be fine if you use the red KW or the black KW that's approved in our franchise documents. You can say KW Legacy Group Realty. But the Legacy Group Realty is the part that is non-negotiable. I've seen a lot of agents that will put Legacy Group. I used to be a little bit more of a stickler on it, but the division says that you don't have to have, you don't have to use realty, whether it's in your name or not necessarily. The problem is it's in our name. It, it is part of us. So if, if it would be like, say, for example, Cutler Real Estate or whatever, they don't have to say real estate because it's not legally part of their name. It's Cutler. Um, and they can say Cutler Real Estate or not. Same thing with Howard Hanna Real Estate Services or whatever. But for us, Legacy Group Realty is the name of our brokerage. I would hate to see somebody get in trouble for leaving Realty off there when, in fact, that is our name. That is our legal name. So, but the KW can be KW. We also have to have the license person. I couldn't just do Willie Team, Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. You cannot. So let's go on to the next slide and I'll kind of go over that. So the next slide is, so if I just told you about the prominence rule and I told you about the name of the brokerage being equal to or greater than the name of the agent, out of these four, which one would actually be compliant? So you're saying the bottom one on the left? Okay. And that is correct because I have my name, which is smaller than Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. At the top, left i only have keller williams legacy group i don't have realty and that's why i say it's kind of a our logos all say realty on it. you're going to find that we've gotten rid of all the ones that just say group so for all all the purposes for example of this it would be the bottom left rich cosgrove is smaller or less prominent than keller williams legacy group realty the one on the top right is my name is bigger that's a problem and on the bottom right i just have keller williams i don't even have legacy group realty which is the name of our brokerage so that's why it'd be a problem. Uh, but Lynette, to your point, you were saying about the team name. So if I had, let's say, for example, it Jose's is easy because his has his name in. So he has JMA, so Jose Medina and Associates. His name is in the advertising, whether it's a team or not. But let's just say for the Killy team, you guys are the Killy team. You don't have, it's not the Lynette or Scott Killy team. So unfortunately, you can have the team name as Lynette, or you can have it as Killy Team. That's not a problem. And Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. Where it becomes a problem is you have to have the name of a licensee in all of your advertising, which means Lynette Killy, Scott Killy. There has to be not necessarily a Killy in there, but there has to be a licensee's name in every form of advertising. So now that really clunkies up things using your words is you've got the name of the agent, the team name and the brokerage name, all on some type of advertising, it, it becomes a problem. It's a lot on a pair. So what I would suggest is if you're doing it on a sign, my suggestion is if you want your team name to be equal to or, or equal prominence as the brokerage name, I would say just put the brokerage name on there and put the team name, then slide in the agent name using a writer. Right. But you have to make sure that it's not more prominent than the team name or the brokerage name. So, but that's my suggestion because those of you that are on teams, you know, you want to advertise the team name and it, you don't always know the agent that's going to be. It's easy for like Diana and myself. It's, it's one agent. You know, we have our, our name on our signs permanently and not in a writer. But if you're on a team, that kind of defeats the purpose of advertising for the team and the brand recognition. Yep. So, all right. So, next. Uh, let's talk a little bit about advertising a listing. So uh, the questions that I would say that you need to ask yourself before you start advertising a listing is, is it yours? Um, does it belong to the brokerage, to Keller Williams Legacy Group? 
So if you say, no, the listing is not mine, but yes, it belongs to the brokerage, I'm going to say to you as the broker, I have no problem of you advertising other agents within our brokerage's listings. However, I do say that you should get the listing agent's permission to do that. Just because I say it's okay doesn't mean that you, it, it's legally okay. It is absolutely okay. But you can also make another agent very upset because perhaps they have a great listing. They want to be the one to advertise it. Uh, they do not want you advertising it so that you can't bring the buyer uh, or get the calls on it because maybe they've spent a lot of money in advertising. Maybe their client only wants to deal with pre-approved buyers and they want to screen everybody, whatever the case would be. I don't, I don't know what it would be, but nonetheless, get permission from the agent if you want to advertise one of our agent's listings. Um, and most of them will all say advertise it. Great. And then if it's another broker's listing, that's really the big question is, do you have the other broker's permission? It's not like I can call up a Howard Hanna agent and say, hey, uh, I would love to advertise your listing. Is that okay with you? And they say, oh yeah, that's fine. My seller doesn't care where the buyer comes from. Go ahead and advertise it. That's not appropriate. I have to actually get the broker's permission, not the agent's permission. So very rare do you see where a broker or an agent is advertising another broker's listing. It just doesn't typically happen. Now, it's different when it comes from the syndication from the MLS. That's totally different. You've put it out there for it to be displayed on other IDX feeds, um, other vows, and all that stuff. That's totally different. But unfortunately, it is not the case when you're trying to put it on Snapchat or any other you know, app, social media app or something like that. So a uh, little bit different there. And then, so I, we talked about, do you have the agent's permission? Yeah. All right. What about just sharing their social media posts? I can do that. Yeah, you can share. share. Yes. Yeah, so if Diana posts her listing on her page and you want to share her post, it's going to have all her information on it. So that's fine. Uh, you're giving credit to the actual listing agent. And again, I would say that most of our agents would be fine if you wanted to use the picture and advertise the listing most of the agents wouldn't care but for those that would you that could be a good way to do it is share it and even then you might make an agent mad because you shared it but you still have permission to do it if you ask them yeah yeah agreed yeah, you should. There shouldn't really be any reason why you can't share it. I mean, it's out there on the MLS anyway. Yeah, it's it's public. So, all right, uh, let's talk a little bit about return addresses. I know that we don't send a ton of things through the mail anymore, but for those of us that do, whether it's a just listed postcard, a just sold postcard, whether it's a um, you know just a solicitation, general solicitation for a listing or a sale or whatever. Um, the return address, if you choose to put a return address on, you must use one of the four that are approved with the state of Ohio. You can't use your personal home address to send out Christmas cards or holiday cards that actually have a solicitation from you in them. Meaning if I send it from Rich Cosgrove, I can do whatever I want. But if I send it from Rich Cosgrove at Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty, that's a whole different story. I can't use my home address anymore. I have to use one of the business addresses. So we have the four main addresses here, um, Canton, Mansfield, Worcester, and then we have New Philly. And then we actually have um, the mega agent offices in Ashland, Mansfield, North Canton, and Plain Township. So those four, um, so we have Tracy Jones, we have Stephanie Webb, and then we have uh, Jose. And then in Plain, we also have um, Ginger Coon. So we have those. You could use their return address. I don't know why you would. I can't imagine why you would, but but those those agents are allowed to use their own return address for those offices as well because they are approved with the division. Uh, social media rules. So one of the things, there is a one-click rule when it comes to social media. So I know there's oftentimes, and uh, you know, you'll 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 see an agent that has advertised and you don't see the brokerage name, let's just say on the first page of the advertisement on Facebook. If I click on that Facebook post and it takes me to a place that has the brokerage name and it has the agent name and it has all the correct information that you're supposed to have for the advertising, then you're okay. They give you a safe one-click rule as long as you can do that and it takes you to the MLS or it takes you to that agent's website or the brokerage website or anything like that, that's fine. But in reality, if somebody shares, so like in Diana's example, if somebody just shares that post and it doesn't have it in there, 
it's not going to one click and go back to your website. It's going to just have that information. So I would say stay away from anything that doesn't advertise your name and the name of the brokerage in your advertisements for Facebook or anything else on social media. All right. Uh, MLS. Um, so for new listing entry, the MLS has changed their I have not entered in a new listing yet since they've changed it. It's been a while. And I can honestly say I used to be very avid about knowing all those. It's pretty cumbersome anymore, it seems. Yeah. There's a lot more choices. Yeah. They're not mandatory, but there's a lot more choices that you can have. They were asking for like the area or something. And it's not something that I can find for sure on the auditor's site to make sure that's true. But I think that's gone now. They only have yeah. like that. Yeah, the area is now gone. It's been taken out because they, it was. the new one for a while. They had, yeah. They had an area. Yeah. So, but for the MLS listing, uh, you need to enter in a listing in the MLS within 24 hours of any public marketing. So if you have put this on Facebook, if you put a sign in the yard, if you put, um, any kind of advertising out there anyway, even if it's a post-it on the front door that says it's for sale, then that means that you have to advertise it in the MLS within 24 hours. Now, the MLS gives you 48 hours to enter a listing uh, for excluding weekends and holidays, but that doesn't mean it changes when you publicly market the property. So if you publicly market it, you have to go by NAR's clear cooperation rule that says it is in the MLS within 24 hours. It doesn't say 24 business hours. It just says 24 hours. Um, the MLS right now is saying that it's 48 business hours, excluding federal holidays and weekends. So if you take a listing on a Thursday, you actually probably don't have to enter it in until Tuesday, that 48 hours later. You can exclude Saturday and Sunday. Uh, if you put the sign in the yard, though, that goes right out the window. You put the sign in the yard when you left on Thursday, you've got 24 hours to put it in there. Uh, I will tell you, I'm on the rules committee right now for MLS and it's kind of aggressive in that room. Like these agents that are on there volunteering for this committee are super over the agents that are taking advantage of this 48 hour rule in different situations. And so they are going to, they, they're proposing the change to the uh, board, uh, the MLS board to say that Saturdays and Sundays are can, going to be considered business days. And so now you'll have no choice, but you have 48 hours, period, or 24 hours to turn in a listing and get it active, period. So, well, the thing is, is for those of us that are at brokerages that the agent enters the listing, it's not really a problem. But for those brokerages where the brokerage enters the listing, they're not going to have somebody on Saturday or Sunday. So I'm kind of like, hey, that kind of gives us a leg up, if you will, at Keller Williams, because you can then go out and say, hey, look at our brokerage. I can enter this on Saturday. I can change the status on Sunday morning. I can do whatever because I have access to it. Not all brokerages allow that. So it is going to be a problem, perhaps, for those brokerages that on Saturdays and Sundays don't have somebody to put in their listings. And I don't know what that means. I don't know if they're just not going to be able to take listings on Friday and advertise them. I'm not sure what that means or if they're going to pay somebody, which I would imagine. Or they're going to tell their agents, you have to enter it yourself on the weekend. So we'll see how that, that changes. But you are responsible for making the status changes in the MLS. And I know that agents that come from more of a full service brokerage, they're like, oh, I hate to do that. I, I never had to do that at my other brokerage. It is so nice being having access to your own listing to be able to change the status when it goes act, or I'm sorry, when it either falls apart and you want to put it active again, or when it goes pending and you want to put it under contract to stop the showings. So it is really nice, but that is your requirement in your responsibility to do that. Um, and then you have the option. It's under contract, allow showings or not allow showings. That's not a choice for you. That is the seller's choice on whether or not they want showings to continue on their property. Not many agents show properties when it's under contract, allow showings because they understand that it's got a contract on it. But maybe it's not a solid contract. Maybe it's a contract that you don't really feel might close, but they took it. And so I would tell you, still show those properties if your clients want to see them. They're available. But if you market under contract, no showings, that means not even you're allowed to show it. So if the deal is falling apart and you know it, you can't tell somebody from your brokerage or yourself, hey, I know this deal is falling apart. Let me get you in there before we have all the paperwork signed to put it back on the market. That is not allowed either. 
If it's no showings, that means you're not even showing. Um, we talked about the 48 hour rule. We talked about 24 hour public marketing and the NAR clear cooperation agreement. Uh, MLS classes are available. They have them. Uh, Amanda can schedule them for the brokerage if you want. You can actually take them online, uh, but there are classes available if you need to learn something there. Um, and then temporarily off the market. This is a struggle right now. Uh, one of the things that we've kind of fought with the MLS about is we had an agent that had a client that only wanted showings three days a week and they were only allowed to be in the evenings from like 5.30 to 8.30 or something like that. And the MLS said, well, you have to take those temporary, you have to take that property temporarily off the market then Friday through Monday because you're not allowed, you're not allowing any showings. And it's like, well, this is the client's house and they're allowed to tell us when they want showings and when they don't. But I will tell you, if you get audited by the MLS and the property is not allowed to be shown for 48 hours straight, they may tell you to take it off the market temporarily. Uh, I've seen it once so far. We're trying to fight them on that and hopefully get it changed. And yet the problem that we're seeing is agents are taking advantage of listing a property for sale on a Thursday or a Friday and saying no showings until Sunday's open house. And that is not allowed. You're not allowed to do that. If it's not allowed to be shown until Sunday, then it shouldn't be active until Sunday. And that's the MLS's stance on it. Um, we had an agent that I just had to talk to at our brokerage that tried to do the same thing. And it's like, don't do it. Because if we find that you're going to do it, we're going to have to take it temporarily off the market. We don't want to be known for that brokerage either. But do you feel like there are agents who build their entire they, there are out. Yes. So well, so interestingly that you say that, Lynette, and so her comment for those of you on Zoom, she said that there are agents that build their whole entire business around that. So if you remember 72 sold was something that Keller Williams was uh, pushing out here a year or so ago, two years ago, whatever it was, 72 sold. And it was a, a program, exactly kind of what you're talking about. And it was very strategic. And it said it didn't violate MLS rules, but it violated our MLS rules because it, that's exactly what it was telling you to do was put the property out there on the market, but don't let there be any showings until this day and this time or whatever. And then only have a small window of when you're allowed to show it and then cut the showings off again so that when people are there, they're like, oh my God, there's all these people looking at this house. Oh, I have to put this house. I, I want this house. And everybody's looking at it. I got to you know, change the price in my mind. I'm going to offer 225 instead of 220 because I want to go over. And it was a whole pitch. Unfortunately, it doesn't fit within MLS rules that we have here in Northeastern Ohio. So I would not recommend doing that, building that, uh, biz building that for your business. So all right, a little bit about MLS now. I'm speaking about MLS now because that's the majority of our agents have MLS now, but we actually have Columbus MLS. We have Firelands MLS. We have um, Mansfield, Ashland. And I think that's all, I think. Uh, but anyway, MLS now, it's every six months. It's billed in February. It's billed in August. It's $228. For anybody that's still on here that's listening, we have nine participants on Zoom and three in the class. I will just tell you out of the 12 of you, if any of you haven't paid your MLS dues, we still owe $12,000 right now uh, out of the 50 some that we started with. So that means that there are plenty of our agents that have not paid their MLS dues. Once you go past a certain date, we will have to shut you off altogether because the MLS and the board have the ability to shut off our entire brokerage for any unpaid dues uh, at the end of December and any time for the MLS. So we we as the brokerage are not being mean to you when we say we have to send your license back or you have to pay your dues. It's very simple. We either get shut off for the entire company or we send your license back or you pay your dues. It's one of the three. Yep, good, good. I'm sure all of you are paid, but I just wanted to mention in case any of you have not paid. Um, and then for Mansfield and Ashland, those are billed directly to the brokerage. And then we put that on your bill uh, each month. One of the things I will say is if you take a listing, so for those of you that are not a member of Firelands, not a member of Columbus, you're not a member of Ashland or Mansfield in all of those boards and or MLS areas, if you take a listing in one of their areas, you must join their MLS because your broker is. If we were not a member of the Columbus MLS and you took a listing there, you could put it in MLS now and you don't have to join. But because the broker, the pri primary broker is a member of all of those, if you take a listing in that territory, 
you have to join them to put it in. You can't put it under me. You actually have to do it under yourself because if it goes in under me, you're not allowed to be mentioned anywhere in the remarks to say like, hey, call Diana or call you know whoever can't do that. So I just say that to you because as things have tightened up, I mean, I looked this morning, there's only 159 properties in all of Stark County that are listed under $275,000. And when I put three or more bedrooms, it dropped to 132. Insane. Or 123, whatever it was. Just insane. So as listings are tight, you are going to find that you're going to take a listing anywhere you can get one. And so just don't be surprised if you take one outside of your normal area. Please be aware of what you're doing in that area and any uh, point of sale inspections and things like that. But know that you may have to join in, uh, another MLS for it. Okay. Um, and then the MLS now does include your Supra access. That does not mean you can go to Columbus and open a Supra. It's two different boards and you cannot open a, a Columbus Supra. Uh, but you can open any in Northeastern Ohio. The photo count is always one. I don't know why you wouldn't want it up to put a photo in for your listing. When I was listing, I didn't even want to put my listing in until I had all the photos available. But I see agents today, they want to get a listing in so bad that they will put three photos on there of the, the, the inside or the outside only. And you have no idea what the inside looks like at all, but you've got it on there for three days. And it's like, to me, you're doing a disservice to your client because people want to see the inside of that house. So that, but at any rate, you must have at least one exterior photo of the listing. The only exclusion on that is commercial and vacant land. Otherwise you have, I think it's, I think it's 48 hours if I'm not mistaken, or 72 hours to get a photo in, something like that. And if you don't, you, you can get fined. So you want to make sure you do that. Well, if they, if you opt out of all photos, I mean, there are, you are able to do that, but there is a, a document in MLS now, interactive documents, your client has to say that they don't want any photos of their property advertised, which is absolutely allowed. Um, I can tell you, I, I learned years ago, there was a property in Marlboro Township and I went to look it up on the tax auditor site. And I'm like, so weird, this property must not exist because I can't, I, I see it in the MLS and there's one photo, but there's nothing else. And I called the agent and the agent said, no, it's one of the Stark County sheriffs. And they're allowed to, as a sheriff or a judge or a person of public like that, they're allowed to exclude their information uh, from public record because they don't want to be found and they don't want to be threatened, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, that was the only time I had that happen. But there are people in that field that'll say, you're not taking photos of the interior of my house or you're not taking a, what is that? Um, Matterport. You're not taking, you know, a diagram of my house because that way when somebody breaks in, they know exactly where to go. Nope, nope, nope. So that can't happen. Uh, one of the things I have on here is you cannot advertise your services as free. So that was part of the Department of Justice lawsuit settlement that we had actually a few years ago, um, back in the previous presidential administration. And now, because of this, we have continued with the lawsuits. This is just a small portion of it now. But there are a lot of buyer's agents that think that they can advertise as free because the buyer doesn't pay a commission. And that's not true. The buyer may not pay a commission, but you are getting paid for your services from the listing brokerage. So you can never advertise your services as free ever. And then, of course, we have the brokerage fee on top of that. So it's not really free anyway. Oh, Free market analysis is fine. That's a service, but you can't advertise your buyer agent. You as a buyer's agent do not work for free, but you can absolutely offer a free market analysis. That's not a problem. Yeah, but you do not work for free as an agent. So, all right, uh, a little bit of our information. So I get asked this all the time. I would highly encourage you to either take a picture of this or go into Dot Loop, take a picture of it. You never know when you're going to need our license number, when you're giving a referral. There are HUD deals that are going to start coming up. We are going to start to see the HUD Home Store. I think we've already seen a few of them. Have you seen any lately? Yeah. You, you've got, okay, on HomePath. So, I mean, home HomePath and yeah. Okay. So they're coming back. So that means the foreclosures for FHA, VA, those are coming back. Um, and so the HUD, you will need this NAID number in order to actually submit an offer. One thing that changed is you used to be able to go in and register yourself under our brokerage. I would tell you that if you think you even might 
sell a HUD home, if you go to HUDHomestore.com, that is, you are not going to be able to register unless you've told me first. I now have to go in and register you under our brokerage before you can submit an offer. So I'm just saying this again, because if it's nine o'clock on a Thursday night, when you go in to make an offer and you say, Rich, I need to get this done. The chances of me ever or getting back to you at that time are probably slim to none. Even just, Even just to make an offer, you've got to have the NEID registered under our brokerage, which most all of you are. If you've been here, yeah, if you've been here for anywhere between probably two plus years, you're probably already registered with us. Because I mean, Diana, I forget when you came over not terribly long ago and you were and you were registered. So uh, but they did just change that here in the last six months. So if you and you never know when you're going to sell one of these properties. But I, I will say, I mean, with 270 some agents, we're not going to go in and at, put every single person in because we have to take you out if you leave and put you in if you come and it's just not worth. So if you if you are interested in being put in that um, database, let me know and I'll, I'll happily add you. Our EIN number in case you need that. Um, and our MLS broker ID is C75759. That's just for camp. We have a different one for Worcester, a different one for Ashland. And I think we might have just done a different one for Tusk County as well, because that way it has the address of the office in those locations so that when you're printing things out, people aren't like, wait, you're from Canton, but you're here in Ashland. So that way it's got your information on it. And all this information is in dot loop under office info. So you can find it. Uh, your NERDS number is your National Realtor Database System. That's what that stands for. Um, however, they did call it now. It's called an M1 number, and that was changed as of January 2022. Every single agent has their own number. If you need to look up your number, just go to NAR.Realtor, and you can look up your own number. You, there's a lot of things you'll need it for, especially I think when it comes to continuing education through NAR. So talk a little bit about commission. Um we used to have green sheets on here. Thankfully, I've updated this and taken it off. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about the antitrust lawsuits uh, that we just had. You cannot go into a listing appointment. And if the seller asks you, what's the average commission? You cannot say the average commission is 3%. The average commission is 2.5% or 5% or 7%. You can't answer that question. You could say, we at Keller Williams charge X, or I don't know what other brokerages charge, but I charge this. That you can answer, and you can answer for your brokerage. So you could say, we typically at Keller Williams charge 3%, if that's what you want to say. Um, I would recommend staying away from that, just because depending upon what you're charging, another agent might be charging something different. So, But you would never say um, the average in this area is 6%. You wouldn't say that. So the code broke. We actually had one agent. I put this on there because years ago we had a brand new agent. Gotta love them. They took a brand new listing. We're so excited. They took it for 3%. They put it in the MLS and they put it in the MLS that they were offering a 3% commission. Guess what that left them? Zero. So they didn't understand that when you are taking a listing, you are procuring the entire commission for both sides, typically. Uh, now that we are on the other side of this lawsuit for, for NAR and Keller Williams, hopefully we still see a lot of sellers offering a commission, which I think that we will, uh, but it is not required that you collect the commission for the buyer's agent. It could be zero. I really don't want to be known for that brokerage, and I really encourage you to try and become masterful with any kind of issues that might arise during a listing presentation, you know, whether you have to partner with somebody in order to do scripting or whatever, uh, you really should become very good at objection handling when it comes to commission for offering a co-broke commission. Uh, you do not, I can guarantee you, you're not going to be happy if you go to show a house and it's zero. You're just not going to be happy. So at any rate, in the MLS, you would offer for example, a 3%, you can offer a 3-2, you could offer a 2.5. Um, the 3-2, I haven't seen those in a while, but I mean, there was a time where we were collecting 6% uh, on the first 100,000 and 4% after that. And so we were offering a 3-2 in the MLS. I don't know if agents are still really doing that. And I'm just not seeing it. Have you seen it lately? Oh, good. Okay. And sometimes, you know, that feels like the seller thinks, oh, I'm getting a deal you know, because you're, you're offering a lesser commission. But in reality, sometimes it doesn't come out to be a, a better fit for them. Depends on the price of the house. So uh, you'll do a command commission request. Lynn can get with you if you have questions about how to do that commission request. And then compliance, 
you really want to try and do your command commission request a minimum of two weeks before you close because we have to go in and check those and it will hold up your your actual pay if we do not have it. There are plenty of agents that wait until they'll say, okay, I don't have, I don't know that my commission may not change. I don't know that the seller is not going to change anything because of inspections or appraisal or whatever. So I'm not even going to do a command commission request. I'm not going to put any of my paperwork in until closing happens. That's fine. You can do that, but just know it's going to hold up your commission because when we get the commission, if the compliance hasn't been checked, you're not getting it until everything's been in submitted for compliance. Uh, Ginger asks, Rich, can you register me to the HUD? Yes. Yes, I can do that. Um, and then our 225 additional commission, it's still on here. It's 295, but there are still some of you that are going to see 225, depending upon the listing that you took or when you entered into maybe a buyer's agency agreement with a buyer, maybe a 225. So there's going to be probably for the next couple months since December or January 1st, we're going to see the 225, 295, and we're okay being flexible on that. I would say after probably June, it's probably not going to be flexible anymore. It's going to be the 295. And if you didn't collect it, then we're going to probably ask the question of why, all right? Um, next, let's talk a little bit about showing time for your $7.50 a month. You get the full version of showing time, which is great. If you have not used it, I highly encourage you to do that. As anybody that has a listing right now that's sitting, showing time has a great uh, program, I guess I would call it, or something that's in their, in their system where you can actually go in and, and say, okay, I wanna pull up Canton City, and I want to see how many showings have happened in houses between $100,000 and $125,000. And it's going to tell you how many showings have actually been scheduled on that home or on those homes in that price range in that area. That can really help you with getting price reductions or just the fact that your seller may say, why aren't we getting any showings? Well, this is why. You're not getting any showings, but neither are any of these other people. Or all of these other people are getting showings and you're not. What's the problem? Maybe we need to take new pictures. Maybe you need to clean something up or do something. Uh, but you get the full version of showing time, which is great. Uh, listings are entered into showing time automatically. When you enter it into the MLS, it takes probably about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but you can set up your client's feedback for uh, email. You can get it yourself and then call your client or text your client. But the email seems to be a great, op uh, great option for most people. You can block out times of days. Like I said, be careful because if you take a listing, you shouldn't be blocking out the next 48 hours. Um, and then you can do the showing reports, which I, the showing reports have been great, in my opinion, uh, just being able to say, this is all the cumulative feedback. This is how many showings we've had on the property. This is everything they've said about it. And sending that to your clients on a weekly basis, especially when you have listings that are sitting on the market for a little bit. I think that's really great. Um, like one of my left cap on it, dropped it, and I like submitted that. Well, the person responded and said something kind of snarky back to me about their house. And I was like, oh, like it doesn't say this is an agent's house. Well, here, and he went straight to that seller. So like I didn't word my stuff in a way to think that it was going directly to the seller. I want to send all my addresses. I do too. That way they're getting exactly what that like does. So well, I guess it'd be nice for agents to realize that this may be going straight to a seller because I might word it differently and that the person's just, I'm thinking that the agent is reading my comment about the cat vomit. So in the room here, uh, the comment is they sent feedback that said there was cat vomit in a property and they got a snarky comment back from the agent who happened to also be, oh, it was not the agent, it was the seller. Okay, so the seller must have contacted you through your email directly. Yeah. Little, you know, you might as well always assume that the seller is going to see whatever you put if 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 the agent has it set up that way but i agree with diana i my feedback goes directly to the seller however you sent it i do not filter it but you do have the option in the full version of showing time to filter it you could say you get it first and review it you can even edit it, believe it or not, before you send it to the seller, which I think is ridiculous because if you're going to clean it up and edit it, it defeated the purpose of getting the honest feedback, in my opinion. Now, I will say there have been times where I have a very, a seller that's very emotional and I choose not to let the feedback go to them. I will get the feedback myself and I will call them and say, well, the showing didn't go so well. And, and I kind of fluff a little bit. Yeah. 
I have done that because my seller is super emotional. I'm sure we've all encountered that. But typically my showings or my feedback goes directly to the seller. Let them get that feedback. And there have been times where I've called an agent that I know and I'll say to them, I'm going to give you some feedback that's going to be very candid. Do you want it or do you not want, like, should I clean it up? What do you want? Because sometimes it's helpful to get a listing price adjusted. Sometimes it's helpful um, for them to go back and be like, okay, well, we had an offer for 200, even though we're asking 225, maybe we should go back to those people. So it, it can be helpful. Honest feedback is always appreciated in my opinion. Um, but anyway, and, and then as far as the client, the contact, you know, text, email, phone, I think that those are all great opportunities. The go and show feature is great, in my opinion. Just if it's a vacant house, just go and show. It emails me. I don't have to worry about setting it up. Um, and then the appointment required. I love how you can go in there and just set up the appointment times that the seller doesn't want somebody and that they do. And it can be set up. And again, it's only $7.50 a month. I mean, we're grandfathered in at a heck of a great price. There are other market centers that are paying $20 a month for showing time for the full version. So it's super, super thankful that we have that opportunity. Um, so yeah, the thing you just think you had a question about, you know, if they, the houses that they want temporarily on the market, if they're not going to yeah. show for a weekend. Is that the simple toggle of a switch or does that involve paperwork with the seller? Always involves paperwork with that. Yeah, so a temporary off market always involves the edit status change form being signed by the seller, understanding that their home is being taken off the market. And then back on again. And yeah, when you take a temporary temporary off the market, you have to put a back on the market date in the broker remarks and what that date is. Yeah. No. Yep, just the agent. The only time I need to sign anything is a withdraw or a withdrawal with release. That's the only time I, and it's really just the withdrawal with release. That's that's the biggest thing is because it's the listing belongs to the brokerage, not to the agent. And so if another brokerage is going to list something, then they need to see that the broker has released it. Uh, there are times where I have not signed it. I mean, I typically sign most things that an agent sends me because I'm trusting that what they're sending is their intent. But I will say there are times where we have not released a listing because we have told the seller repeatedly to reduce their price and they're not listening to us on our marketing and they're not happy because the house isn't selling. Well, they're not happy because they're not listening. If they want to listen to us and let us do our job, then we'd be happy. You know, if we weren't doing our job, fine, go about your day and that's fine. But I will also say sometimes it's just easier in this world, release the seller and let them go because Fighting with them is not going to do you any good. Us holding up their listing isn't going to do them any good. They're going to hate us. They're going to hate you. And it's just going to turn into a problem. So unless there's a legitimate reason that you feel so compelled to hold somebody up from selling their home, it's not worth it. Release it. So um, who signs a listing or a purchase agreement? It's amazing to me how many agents will go out and list a house for sale, even at our own brokerage. I can think of one right now. They went out and listed a home, assuming that the person they were talking to, why wouldn't you, is the owner of the property. We don't ask for a driver's license. We don't ask for a picture, an ID of any kind. Um, it was not the owner of the property. They didn't own the property, but the agent listed it for sale and put it out there. And all of a sudden, the owner called them and said, what are you doing listing my property for sale? That tenant that's in that property doesn't own it and they can't sell it. And... Uh, we had to take it off the market and, you know, do some rear end kissing. And, but, you know, it was, it was very bad. So I would just say to you, you know, it's not a bad idea necessarily to probably ask. And I never thought about that 20 some years. And I've never had to ask somebody for their driver's license. I just assume it, but it's now happened. And I could say, it's not a bad idea to say, maybe I should see your driver's license to know you are who you say you are uh, when I go to list your home. Cause one wouldn't think you would do that, but uh, it's always a good idea when you go with our listing agreement or the purchase agreement, ask your client, are you single? Are you married? I can think of another one right now when same-sex marriage came out, not terribly long after that, I knew of a same-sex couple that actually sold their property and the agent and the title company never had the spouse sign anything. So to this day, I know that if something happens when those people go to sell their house that bought it back then, there is potentially an issue on the title because the spouse never signed off the house. They ne and, and were never asked to by the title company. So I will just say to you, when you ask a question, if somebody's married, ask them if they're married and it doesn't matter whether it's a same sex couple or not, you need both signatures on everything if you can get it. Um, I'm not gonna fight tooth and nail for that, but I will say if you get to a closing and you didn't get 
both of the married parties, I don't care if they're in the middle of a divorce, unless you have a document from the court and the judge that says you only need one signature, you get both because if Diana and I are married and I'm selling my house to you and all of a sudden, I don't even say that I'm married. She's off on a vacation somewhere and I'm pissed, excuse me, I'm mad. And so I decide to sell my house without her and I'm the only one on the deed and I do everything with you. You come out and negotiate and I list my property with you and she has no idea. And all of a sudden we get to closing and I'm the only one that signed the listing document, the purchase agreement. And she goes, well, I'm not selling my house for that or I'm not selling my house at all. Guess what? You've got a big problem on your hands as the listing agent because you just listed a house, wasted everybody's time, money and energy on a house you couldn't legally sell. That's a problem and that's a lawsuit. So you, that's why I say on our listing agreement, our purchase agreement, always get the spouse's signature. That's just a good rule of thumb. Um, all right. And then uh, trust. So who is a trustee? There could be a trust, uh, a living trust or in a re irrevocable trust. It could be revocable. It could be a trust of a person that's deceased. Get the trust documents and know who is able to sign on behalf of that trust. Because if my siblings and I are all listed as trustees and in the trust documents, it says you need all three siblings to sign the trust to sell the house, to sign those documents. I need all three. I can't just do it off one. So you need to make sure you know who you're talking to and who's able to sign on behalf of the trust. Same thing with an estate sale. Are there multiple siblings? Well, if the house goes into the siblings' names and the siblings are married, you now need the siblings and their spouse's signatures because they have dowry. If it stays in a trust or it stays in the deceased person's name and the child is just named as the administrator or executor, that's different, but you need to understand what the situation is. And we've had all of these and it can get really ugly. Uh, divorce, like I said, it's the same thing while buying or selling. If you are, well, I've had plenty of clients over my career say, I'm getting a divorce. I don't want my spouse to know that I'm buying a new house, but I want to buy it. I'm paying cash or I'm financing it. Well, guess what? You're going to let your other spouse that you don't want to know uh, that you're buying a house because they're going to own half of it when you, because Ohio's a dower right state the moment that you close on it. And by the way, if you're taking a loan out on it, they're going to know it because they have to sign off on closing too. You have a question? Yep. divorce is final or like something on this Thursday, mm -hmm. they close the 22nd. Their, their divorce is final, but he entered into that contract while still going through the divorce. Or should we be that's a great question. I would say that's probably an attorney question, but the, the question in the room is, if I entered into a purchase agreement to purchase a property before my divorce was settled, but I'm getting divorced this Friday and I don't close on the house until the 22nd, does my spouse still have interest in that property? I'm going to say no, most likely, because if your divorce is final, anything you do after that, I know they entered into the contract before, I would... Yeah, yeah, you could, but they wouldn't be on the contract in the first place. They were they were never on it. It's really just for dower and for closing. I think it comes. So, so one party did buy a house during divorce. Divorce is final. Friday. Yeah, he didn't but sign it. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, but but I'm saying that here's here's the if it's a cash deal, it's really probably not going to matter. But if it's financing. Okay, then it's probably really not going to matter if it's cash deal. But if it's financing, did the person applying for the loan commit mortgage fraud by saying they were not married or divorced? That's going to be the question because on your mortgage application, you have to put whether you're married or not. And if you lie on your mortgage application, you're basically committing mortgage fraud. So, so I would say cash, you're probably good. And I think you would be okay otherwise, as long as they didn't lie on their mortgage application, they should be fine. Yeah. All right. And so Ohio, Arkansas, and Kentucky, I think Kentucky just stopped dower rights. It's only Arkansas and Ohio. So lucky us. And it's not on the legislator's docket anytime soon to get rid of it. So. I think, like, I think, I don't want my husband to be able to go buy property without, or sell it without me. Well, each state has different laws. So yes, they, you know, in Ohio, because we have dower rights, they can't buy or sell without you. But like, I know for like collection purposes for like credit cards and stuff, there's like five states that the spouse is not responsible for your debt. Ohio is not one of them, but there are there are states where if you, Lynette Kelly, took out debt and you're married to Scott 
and you don't pay it, he's not responsible for your debt. So it depends on the state and the laws and things like that. Yeah. So um, talk a little bit about an escrow letter. So the escrow letter, I did have one agent. They had been in the business for a very long time, transferred to our brokerage. He goes, I've never done an escrow letter in my life. <laughs> no, it wasn't you, but, but you're one of them. Yeah. yeah. So the escrow letter is not as uh, cumbersome as it might seem or sound. It's it's very easy. Um, it is in dot loop. And it's basically just the buyer's and seller's information, whatever your commission amount is, is there a home warranty closing costs being paid for by the seller on behalf of the buyer, what your closing date is and lender information. There's some other things on there, but really it just, it's a synopsis of your entire transaction. You send that to the title company. It's a great idea to send it to the title company up front. You can always amend it later if you need to, uh, but because it has all that basic contact information and information for everybody on it, um, the title company just needs that one document. And so if you want paid, you want to make sure you get that over there because most title companies I know are not sending a check to anybody without that escrow letter verifying the amount of commission that you're on. So, and that is the agent's responsibility here to get that filled out. Or if you have a team admin, then they can do it. So choosing a title company, I think it's great. So I, I, you know, Sandy Fox is on here, at least she was earlier. So I think um, I say this because it's it's funny down in that area. I know that that area in Tuscarawas County is different than we are here in Stark County. It's different than Summit County and going up to Cuyahoga County. There have been in my career so many different ways that people say a title company is supposed to be chosen. And at the end of the day, the only way it's chosen is by a buyer and a seller agree. It is not seller's choice. It is not buyer's choice. It's not what's customary in an area. Um, I have heard so many agents over the years, even when I was a brand new agent, they're like, well, the seller gets to choose. And then it was, oh, the buyer gets to choose. And you didn't know. You just didn't know what the rule was. you know. And But I can honestly say the rule is there is no rule. It is the buyer and the seller agree on the title company. So it's 100% negotiable. Just because you have an ABA does not mean that it's automatically your um, deal. Uh, if the seller's paying the closing costs, the seller does have a choice though. That is the one caveat is if the seller is going to pay $5,000 in the buyer's closing costs, well, then they're pretty much paying all of the closing costs for the title insurance. And the title insurance is the most expensive thing. If they feel like they want to get a better deal at a company somewhere else, they're going to choose because they're paying for it. But otherwise it's negotiable. Uh, and that's why I say on here, you know, old school rules, buyer's choice, seller's choice. Nope. Doesn't matter what's customary. It's hundred percent negotiable and don't lose a deal over title company. I know one agent I can think of the top of my head that every time I get a deal from him, I get the same story. Well, they bought and sold with this person before, or they have a deal going with them right now. So they want to use this title company. No, they don't. You own that title company and that's why you want to use them. And so it's just comical to me that, you know, agents will come up with all kinds of different reasons uh, on why to use their ABA. And the simple answer is it's up to the consumer. All right. Uh, home warranty. So we do have America's Preferred Home Warranty. That's our preferred company. We do also offer a 210. I don't know if we have any brochures back there still because we are with America's Preferred now. Um, but registering the warranty, this is something that's recently changed with America's Preferred. If you're unaware of it on every single transaction, if you get signed, which is why we require it, the release of the warranty or waiver, whatever you want to call it, or the actual warranty contract sign, if you are sued on that transaction as the agent, America's Preferred Home Warranty will pay half of your deductible for your e &O insurance, which is $5,000. So they will cover $2,500 just by you getting that form signed, okay? Now, we require you to also do that because we have a lot of agents that are like, oh, this person's buying a $400,000 house. They've got the money if their furnace breaks. They don't need a warranty. Or this buyer is buying a $30,000 house. They don't have an extra $500 for a warranty. We're not even going to offer it. We have to offer the same service to every single person. So that is the other reason why we have you sign that is it's twofold. It's going to help you get your e &O, uh, coverage protected. And also it's going to protect the brokerage saying you offered a warranty to everybody. Okay. Yeah. No, it's one or the other. So it's either the waiver or the application. You can use either. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. They both have an accept or decline. So whichever one you want to use is absolutely fine. Um, and at any rate, I would say for the warranty purposes, the, the change that I, that I was going to talk about is, 
I think we're going to talk about it in our upcoming team meeting, but America's Preferred has changed it now. You're actually going to have to go into their website and you have to decline the warranty or offer the acceptance, I believe. Um, you just click it, though. It's if, and I haven't gone through the training yet, but I am telling you there's a change coming. They do not know about every listing we have, but that's the thing is they're going to do a training for us that tells us that every listing we have, we need to go in and create basically a deal in their system. And they may get a copy of all the MLS inputs. I don't know how they get their information to be honest with you, but we are gonna have to go in for every single transaction that we have for every client that we have and log into their system and either elect to get it or decline it. I think they're getting rid of the data collection sheet if I'm not mistaken. Um, but in order for us to get paid, basically, if there's an acceptance, we have to do that. But also if we want our e &O coverage accepted by them or for them to pay half of it, if you sell up, uh, if you don't sell a home warranty, but you sell a property moving forward and you don't do anything with the their website going in and declining or accepting it, if you get sued for that transaction, they won't cover your $2,500 deduct. Mm -hmm. $2,500 of your deductible, even if there was no warranty. That's right. That's right. That's right. And that's always been the case. That's on buyers and sellers, both. Okay. Yep, yep. Buyers and sellers, both. You'll be covered under the $2,500. Um, and it, they say they pay half the deductible. I don't know that they know our deductible is 5,000. I'm telling you 20, you know, it's 2,500 that they would pay, but they say it's half of your deductible. I'm assuming they know it's 5,000, but we'll get more clarification coming up. Like I said, hey, Amanda, as you're walking by, have you heard anything? Are we doing anything on the America's Preferred Home Warranty having Gina? She was supposed to be, I think, in one of our meetings and canceled. Is Ty? A week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow. Okay, so there's so hang on, stay tuned. There's there's I want to get you guys the information because, like I said, it's going to be important that you know. On Wednesday, thirteenth, on Zoom. Wednesday the 13th at one o'clock on Zoom only. Is it Gina or Ty? Gina. Okay. And it might even be Renee. Okay. But this is to go over the new process for the America's Preferred Home Warranty. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. They may have increased some pricing too. Yeah. You don't have to go to their website. If you don't, though, you're just not covered if you're sued. That's all for your E and O. Well, you're covered. You're covered for your E and O insurance, but you're not covered for them to pay half of your deductible. Yeah. And I mean, you think that that's not a problem until it's a problem. I mean, honestly, agents, there are some agents that they couldn't come up with a thousand dollars, let alone five thousand dollars. So, I, I mean, to just have to go to the website. And, and register that property that it is or is not getting warranty for $2,500. Yeah. yeah. Dealing with yeah. getting, but you have to go in on every listing or every deal. So here's why I feel like they want it. They want to track it. They're going to market to those people. And they, they probably will market to those people. <laughs> and again, that's the thing is you guys have the choice as agents. Basically, at the end of the day, it's just to say, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. And I'm just telling you that you're going to wish you did it when you wanted that $2,500 deductible paid as opposed to the 5,000 full. So, but you still need the warranty contract or waiver as of the moment. Just don't, don't change anything until we go to the 13th and have this meeting and, and go from there. So we'll go from there. Uh, the consumer guide. I want to go over this. A lot of agents don't get the consumer guide signed. I know when I was a new agent, I didn't even, I was nervous as all get out to get a consumer guide signed. I never had a client sign it. And I, I got burnt a few times early in my career and learned my lesson. And once you go to a property 
uh, to show a property and you don't provide the consumer guide and you get burnt on it because another agent closes on it with the consumer, you're going to kick yourself in the rear end. But um, the consumer guide is supposed to be signed before you talk about financing or anything with a client. It can be signed electronically. It can be stored electronically. But you must ask this the client to sign the consumer guide at your very first opportunity to meet with them um, or talk to them about financing or anything like that. You have to provide them with a copy of what they signed. And if they refuse to sign it, you have to mark on there, refuse to sign keep a copy of it, but you have to keep a copy for three years. And again, you can keep a digital copy, you can keep a paper copy, but you have to keep a copy for three years. And believe it or not, it has been called into question on transactions that we haven't even been a part of, but have been at the division level or a lawsuit's been filed. We've had other brokerages that because of the division will email us and say, hey, you also showed this person a property. We need to see the, the signed consumer guide. Well, we better have it because we have to keep it for three years. So I would tell you as the, from the broker's perspective, what I do is I have a loop and I just have it consumer guides of 2023 or 2020. And I scan and upload every consumer guide that I have. And then I shred the other one because that way I have a digital copy and I can't lose. it. So just a great thing for you to have, because there will be times where you will show people a house that will never, ever buy a house from you. And you'll think, well, I don't need this consumer guide. Yes, you do. You're supposed to have it for three years. So, um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, if, 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 I mean, I've never had, if somebody is really refusing to sign and you write refuse to sign, typically they're not going to then sign it because, but, and that's fine. Maybe they will. My people, if my people are like refuse to sign, I write refuse to sign, and that's the end of it. So, all right, but it's signed per client, not the number of, of houses you show them. So, okay. All right, uh, showing a house. Uh, I don't know how much I need to go over this. I don't want to take up too much time. We're already uh, an hour and five minutes in, but uh, showing remarks, pay attention to them in showing time because if somebody tells you don't lock the screen door, don't lock the screen door because you've just locked everybody out of the house now uh, for future showings. If they say don't lock the house between the house and the garage, the garage, you know, door don't do it um are there going to be dogs in a cage in the basement i have gone into showings where i didn't pay attention to the remarks and the dog scares the bejesus out of you in a cage downstairs in the basement or you hear a dog barking you don't know if you should go in are there cameras do you want your shoes on or off uh if you're not going to be on time text the listing agent and make sure you're still allowed to go during the time that you're able to go because sometimes they don't want overlapping showings i have been um i have had clients call me they're like these people are over an hour late. I've been home and I'm giving my child a bath and they show up or I'm getting dinner ready and they show up. No, you can't do that. You go during your scheduled time or you don't go or you get it amended. Um, never leave the do door open for another agent. I mean, I've had agents that I know very well that I still put the key back in the lockbox and lock the door. Um, I'm sure in my career, I've done plenty of things where if it was Diana or, or Lynette or somebody, I'm sure there's been times where I'm just like, all right, I'll leave the door open. Here's the key, whatever. It's not a great look. You shouldn't do it because you're ultimately responsible for whoever, whatever happens to that property because you didn't lock it and secure it. You are going to be responsible, especially if you're the one that opened the Supra. That's the biggest thing is if there's a Supra on the property, put that key back in there and make the other agent get it back out because you are the last person noted to have that key. And if something happens, it's it's on you. Um, so do that at your discretion. If you know the agent, I know there's a little wiggle room there, but but really you should make sure everything's locked uh, and closed up the way it's supposed to be. I always like to leave a card on that counter. You don't have to do that, but it's great. The seller knows you were there, uh, especially if it's occupied. Turn off the lights or don't turn off the lights. There are plenty of people that say in their showing remarks, do not turn off the lights. We have so many showings that day. They want the lights on, it's staged, whatever. Pay attention to what it says. Um, and again, make sure that you lock doors or don't, depending upon what the showing remarks say. And the com combination of lockbox, don't leave the code when you lock it up. There's so many times that agents just leave it on the last uh, digit and they don't scramble the code or do anything. And so you can go right up and get it. So you want to make sure you're protecting the consumer. Uh, I only have three more slides and we'll get done. Uh, feedback for showings. It really is important to give feedback. I can't tell you. So I am the terrible guy that you can set up on showing time how many times it asks for feedback. Mine asks you five times or five or six, whatever the maximum is that you're allowed to ask for, it will send you one every 24 hours until you actually give the feedback. And I don't care that it annoys you because 
It's important that my client gets the feedback. I'm going to give it to you. And it's amazing to me how many agents will call you when you don't leave feedback, but they will never call you back or email you back if you don't leave feedback for them. It's ridiculous. So leave feedback. I didn't. I have never seen that. So I don't know if anybody in chat here or on uh, the participants on Zoom. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ginger. Uh, she says, preach it. Completely agree. Um, but Diana was asking a good question, which I don't know the answer to because I've never seen it, is there, I guess, are buyer's agents that can somehow click uh, or change their settings in showing time that, what is it? They opted out of giving feedback. And so if you are the listing agent and it gets sent to them, you get a message back that says the listing agent you get nothing. Oh, so they opted out of feedback. I wonder if they. I wonder if they get the request and just click on something that says "I opt out of feedback." That's rude, anyway. Yeah, that could be. I've not seen that before, but that would be rude. Yeah, I mean, don't show the house if you can't get feedback. Just that simple. But send a text message, call the agent, give it however you can give it back to them. Supra sends one. I like to go through showing time because there's a great record of it, but maybe not everybody does. Um, let's see here. Working with other agents, be courteous. Um, you know, I look around this room and, and the people that are on Zoom, and I think it's it's interesting because many of us have been in this business for such a long time. If you have like goals to be an agent in 15 years from now, you better be courteous to these agents because guaranteed you're going to do a deal with them again. And all of those agents think, oh, I just need a win for my client. I'll never have to deal with these people again. Oh, yes, you will. You will have to deal with them. And they will remember you when you're a turd on the other end of it. They will absolutely remember you. And your deal may or may not go through because you were a turd. Um, it's not about winning or losing. It's about getting the house for the right terms for the clients that are involved. You may not like the terms. You may think they're overpaying for it. You may think they got a great deal. It doesn't matter what you think. Your job is to listen to your consumer and follow their lawful instructions. That's what your job is. Um, and follow the rules. Don't give away information. It's always interesting to me. And don't get me wrong. I'll use it to my advantage too. I will call a listing agent and say, so what can you tell me about the property? Is there anything the sellers are looking for? I mean, it, and it, you'd be amazed at the things an agent will tell you they shouldn't tell you. Yeah, you get the right agent and they will just tell you everything. So I, I say that for you, don't be that agent that tells everything. Your client may not want other people to know they're going through a divorce. They may not want people to know that they're relocating out of state because they think, oh, then I'm desperate. So you don't know what they may or may not want you to share. Uh, the other thing is with multiple offers, you should be having a conversation upfront with your consumer as a listing agent do you want me to disclose multiple offers? Do I have your permission to do that? Yes or no? Because if I'm the listing or if I'm the buyer's agent and I call you and say, do you have multiple offers? And you answer the question, yes. And my client says, oh, I don't want to be in multiple offers. Never mind. I'm not going to write on the property anymore. And the seller says, well, why didn't they want to write? And I, as the listing agent, say, well, because we were in multiple offers. Well, I didn't tell you you could do that. You, you, you could cause a problem. So don't give away information that you're not supposed to. And always communicate. When I say communicate, it is not difficult. I know that there are millennials in this world that don't like to pick up the phone and text. Fine, text. That's fine if that's what you have to do. I prefer the phone. Call me old. But I will say this too. When you send an offer to me and I have never spoken to you via text, email, or a phone call, and I just get an offer from you out of the blue, I really question whether or not I want to work with you because I'm really wondering how you sent over this offer but never called me to tell me it was on the way. If I didn't check my email, maybe I'm running out the door to go meet with my seller and I didn't check my email because I didn't know an offer was coming. Your buyer just lost out on this because you didn't pick up the phone and call me. So communication is huge. Call the agent, text the agent, email the agent, but don't just send over an offer. So. I remember this correctly. It seems like um, a rule, I guess, that if you have offers, you have to, and someone asks, so if you're the listing agent and another agent asks if you have offers. That if you're the listing agent and a buyer's agent asks you if you have you offers, offers, you it depends. You 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 
Well, you have you have to answer it the way your seller has instructed you to answer that. If your seller says, I don't want you to disclose multiple offers, then when I get asked if there are multiple offers, I would have to say, my seller has chosen not to give that information. Or even say anything about it. Yeah, or if you even say... It's like, on, and I don't know if I saw it somewhere, or if it's sort of a, like where if I ask, you have to tell me if there's at least an offer, I guess, or something like that. I don't, I, yeah, I don't have to tell you that there is or is not an offer on the property um, based on what my seller says. If my seller says, I don't want you to disclose multiple offers, or if there are any offers, then I don't disclose that. Um, I think what you're maybe relying on is that the buyer's agent can ask if their offer was presented. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. The thing like, well, if I ask, you have to tell me whether or not, like, I don't know where I have that from, but I feel like yeah. that's sort of the, because agents ask a lot, which is why. They do. But um, I feel like it's strictly like whether or not there are any. Okay. But that's good. I just wanted to be able to that for my So Melissa is asking after the seller has picked an offer to go with. I'm not sure what that means. After the seller has picked an offer to go with, if they accepted an offer in multiples. So after the seller has picked an offer to go with in multiples. Yeah, I don't know. Melissa, you're going to have to ask the question because I'm not following you. I'm sorry. You can unmute yourself, by the way, too, and just talk, if that's easier. The buyer's agent always asks. Oh, sorry, Rich. Okay, yeah, so buyer's agents always ask, hey, my offer didn't get picked. What can you tell me about the other offer? At any point in multiples, when we call for higher and best, or if the seller has already picked an offer, can we disclose anything about the other offers if seller has given us permission to do so? Yeah, if the seller is giving you permission to tell the other agents why their offer wasn't chosen, then you absolutely can. I wouldn't unless the seller tells you to do that simply because if that deal falls apart and you're soliciting new offers, you've basically just given the other agent the reason why their offer wasn't chosen and maybe they're going to change it. But if you didn't give that same feedback to the other three people mm -hmm. on why their offer wasn't chosen, like why the one was chosen, it could be a problem. So I, you can disclose anything the seller allows you to disclose is what I would say. What about during high, like when you're waiting for highest and best? When you're waiting for highest and best, if the seller. Yes. And the seller says, yes, I want them to compete against each other. You can disclose what each one is at or where they're at. Do you know oh, what yeah. I mean? If the seller says there's nothing confidential about it. When you as the buyer's agent give your offer to the listing agent and the seller if the seller says, I want you to tell all three offers. So let's say we have four offers. One's at 200,000, the other ones are below it. And your seller instructs you to go back to those other three and say, we have an offer for $200,000. If you can beat it, then mm -hmm. I want to see it. Or it's 200,000, what can you do? You absolutely can disclose that. If the seller instructs you to do so, yes. Okay. Yep, you can absolutely shop the offers against one another. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. And I think this is the last slide. Uh, two more. So earnest money deposits. So cash is never acceptable. Personal check is acceptable. We do not take personal checks. Uh, we don't take earnest money of any kind because unfortunately, um, those escrow accounts, we have to hold the money for two years. And when people don't agree and it's just a lot to go with, it's better. Let the title company hold it. Um, most of the title companies anymore wire their fund or have you wire their funds or pay by debit card um, over the internet, which is fine. Um, but who's holding the earnest money? There's no law on who holds the earnest money. Believe it or not, the seller could hold the earnest money. The agent could hold the earnest money. I never recommend that, but anybody can hold the earnest money. There's no law that says who can hold the earnest money. Um, who collects the earnest money, though, I will tell you is when it comes to the buyer's agent, you need to make sure, please make sure you are asking your client for the earnest money and get proof that the earnest money was turned in. If you on the listing side don't get verification that the, the earnest money was turned in, you are just as guilty as the buyer's agent because you didn't ask for it. And I can't tell you how many times when a deal goes to fall apart, somebody's like, well, you're not going to get the earnest money back. And the buyer's like, well, ha ha, the joke's on you because I never gave it. And then you as the buyer's agent are like, oh, crap. So you need to make sure that you're getting 
the earnest money collected. It is your job to get it there. And I can tell you, there are times where you're working with an investor out of California or somewhere else that says, oh, I'm going to send, I'm going to send, I'm going to send it. And they never do. As long as you have a paper trail as the agent that says, I have asked them repeatedly for it, you're going to be in the clear. But if you never ask them for it, you're probably going to be in trouble. And I don't mean in trouble with me. I mean the division of real estate because it's your job to get it collected. Um, and then always send a copy of the check or the wire to the listing agent so that they know that it was collected and that they actually have. It. Uh, it's always also a great idea to send it to the lender when it clears so the lender has that as well. Um, and then how does your client get their earnest money back? So I think, I mean, I think we've done a pretty good job here of all the agents understanding how earnest money gets distributed. Uh, I don't oftentimes get the call anymore where I have to hear, you know, grandma gave her last $500 and she really needs that money back. And it doesn't matter why she needs the money back. The, the answer is until a mutual release is signed by both parties, the earnest money is not getting distributed. Uh, that's Ohio law. Uh, and it's written in our contract, and then it is held for two years unless the buyer or seller sues the other party over it. Otherwise, it is staying for two years, and then the depository can write a check to the person that gave them the money after a, two, a period of two years. That's it. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. That's what the law is. That's what's written in our contract. Um, and so if the deal falls apart, get a mutual release. There's no guarantee the buyer is getting the earnest money back. It could be split between the buyer and seller perhaps as well. Um, and then the last thing, just seller net sheets. I always recommend, I can tell you, I'm surprised at the amount of agents that go on a listing appointment that do not take a net sheet with them. I don't know how you can go to a listing appointment and not tell the seller what they're going to net after the costs. But I have won more listing appointments, which I hate to say that that's part of the reason that I've won, but I, think, I hope it's just a small reason. But I mean, I've won them because they're like, oh, you're the only person that brought this net sheet. We had no idea what we were going to walk away with. You're kidding me. So uh, use the title company, uh, this, the uh, title capture app. Stonegate has one. I'm sure your favorite title company has one, um, but always a great, great idea. So any questions, anything we didn't cover? That's just kind of a general synopsis of real estate. Yes. Oh, hang on, Lynette. Somebody said yes. Hang on one second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who's on Zoom asking? Hey, it's Ginger. Um, Ginger. Do we know a deadline or is there a deadline on the horizon to have to switch the buyer agency forms? So the buyer, so she's asking about the buyer agency forms. Is there a deadline? So I can tell you that there is a six month deadline that we as Keller Williams have to enact a few forms. The settlement agreement that was done between Remax, Keller Williams, NAR, and the only person that hasn't settled yet is BHHS. Um, we have six months from February, so changes will be coming. I imagine that the buyer agency agreement that the division has that we're using, I'm sorry, that the state has that we're using right now will be updated as well because one of the things that we have to do is on our listing agreement and or a separate disclosure, we have to have a disclosure that says that all commissions are negotiable. They are not set by law. And then we have to have a pre-disclosure before closing as well that says the same thing. So I can tell you now that the buyer agency agreement will most likely be changing to have that disclosure on it. Uh, I'm hoping they don't make it longer than three pages because there is room on that third page to add something. Um, but changes are coming and there's the timeline is within six months, but I can't tell you specifically for us other than it will be within six months. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Lynette's got a question. Yep. Well, well, yeah. So on the buyer agency agreement, I wonder if there's a way to make it like it's flexible by how. Like <clears throat> I think the way it is right now, the new one. Is I can't imagine it would be flexible by house because it's client specific. Like but the whole. Any money? Like, but I've got this buyer agency agreement that says my buyer is going to pay me three percent. No, like the blue frame is very, very thin. Yeah, well, it says that the buyer agrees to pay this, but it says that you can get money from more than one party to make that up. So if you're getting it through the MLS, then you would forgive the client's portion of it, perhaps, or a sip up uh, uh, some of it, perhaps. So yeah. But you would never want it property specific because you don't know what property you're going to show them. I want contracts to my buyers to say that I may or may not need money from 
based on the house. Like, so if I show you a house yeah. and it's this jerky guy who's offering five hundred dollar commission, I'm gonna need you to kick in. So my Lynette's question is basically, yeah, is there is the disclosure going to say something like I may not need to get money from the buyer because the seller is offering it through the selling brokerage. And so on this house, you may owe me $3,000, but on the next one, you may owe me nothing. It's really going to come down to a discussion. I don't, I can't tell you, I can tell you the forms that the state worked on. They worked on those for almost two years. There were three attorneys, there were multiple realtors. So I think they're about as good as they're going to get. I don't think they're going to change it to say what you're, what you're thinking it should say. And not to say that it couldn't, I just doubt that they're going to update it. Better. Pushing it in a way that, well, if you're going to go ahead and get your buyers to sign up to pay you, then we're going to stop at listing agents getting buyer commissions. And then, so now the need to change, boom, done. And we've sort of put the wagon to the floor. The way I read that that document is basically the buyer is agreeing to pay you X, whatever X is, but they can pay you, you can get paid and get to that amount through the listing brokerage and the buyer or just the buyer or the listing brokerage. I don't think it says in there specifically that they're going to owe you that money in addition to. So I, I, I see what you're saying, but I think it's the way you explain it to them is this is what you owe me. How I get it doesn't matter. Whether I get it from the listing broker, whether I get a portion of it from the listing broker and you, but, but if I go to a house that offers zero, this is what you owe me. That's what really just needs to be conveyed. I imagine you could add something if you wanted to, but I will also tell you that form is copyrighted. All of their forms are copyrighted. Okay. So I don't know that you really should be adding anything because it has that copyright on it. You could do an addendum, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm just going to ask, like, um, we one more question. If uh, you were at a listing and you, you specifically mentioned, you know, getting your seller's permission to um, whether or not to share stuff and, um, you know, form multiples or some of those things. And I know um, there's a certain, uh, there's a few other things that I feel like you can ask your seller these questions. And let's say you've kind of created a checklist. Yep. Can I just have my own simple version of that and ask the, you know, ask the seller to confirm that this is accurate sure. and sign? It doesn't need to be a lawyer prepared. No, you could, you could have a checklist. You could create a checklist. You or your team does not have to be lawyer prepared. That would be a checklist that would just say, uh, do you authorize me to disclose multiple offers? Yes or no. Do you authorize me to share that you're moving or relocating? Yes or no. Whatever it would be. Yes, you could absolutely do that. Anybody on Zoom, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Welcome.